The National Basketball Association is no stranger to controversy. From the antitrust lawsuit filed against the league by Hall of Fame player Oscar Robertson, to the numerous accusations of referees putting their own personal imprints on playoff games, the NBA has a sketchy history to say the least. But the biggest sin this league has ever committed is one that it has never gotten properly shamed for. The NBA's own origin story is a complete lie, and that's by design. Leo Ferris is a name I'll bet you've never heard of, and that's quite a shame. With the exception of a select few who were around during the early days of the NBA, Ferris's name, like many others, has been all but forgotten. But I say this without hyperbole, Leo Ferris is the most important person in NBA history. In only nine years of being associated with professional basketball from the late 1940s to the mid-1950s, Ferris changed the course of the sport's history in more ways than one, all of which we're still feeling the effects of. In the 1940s, there were two major professional basketball leagues in the United States, the National Basketball League, otherwise known as the NBL, and the Basketball Association of America, the BAA. As co-founder of the NBL's Buffalo Bisons, today known as the Atlanta Hawks, Leo Ferris was a key contributor in breaking down race barriers that had existed in professional basketball since the growth of startup leagues in the early 1920s. In October of 1946, Ferris signed Hall of Fame player William Gates to the then Tri-Cities Blackhawks, the first time a black player was brought into a white pro basketball league. This took place seven months before the Brooklyn Dodgers broke down baseball's race barrier with the signing of Jackie Robinson. Here we see the first instance of the NBA rewriting its own history. The way they tell it, the Boston Celtics broke down basketball's race barrier in 1950 by making Chuck Cooper the first African-American player to be drafted by an NBA team. Now before you say that the NBL and the NBA are two different things, they are not, and I will prove that in a moment. But if that was all Leo Ferris did, initiating racial integration of the sport on a professional level, that should be enough to earn him induction into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. But Leo did so much more for this game than just that. In the three years preceding what would become the most important day in NBA history, the BAA and NBL were fighting a brutal battle to win over both players and fans. After the BAA's creation in 1946, it began an uphill climb in hopes that it could one day dethrone the NBL, itself established in 1937, as the preeminent professional basketball league in the United States of America. With the effects of this fight for talent and ticket sales taking a toll on both leagues toward the end of the 1940s, Leo Ferris, now serving as vice president of the NBL as a whole, looked to make a move that would put things to an end once and for all. While many associate the Fab Five with Chris Webber and Jalen Rose's groundbreaking Michigan State Wolverines teams, the Fabulous Five of Kentucky State made a statement of their own in the 1940s by winning two NCAA championships. The team was led by a trio of All-Americans, Alex Groza, Ralph Beard, and Wally Jones, with supporting players John Holland and Cliff Baker rounding out the starting lineup. All five players were prime targets for both leagues to go after once they left college. The feeling coming out of the 1949 college season was whichever league signed three out of those five players would take a significant lead in the battle for brand supremacy. That was the goal, three out of five. And while there might have been some delusional hopefuls, no one realistically thought either league had the leverage to pull off a sweep and acquire every member of the Fabulous Five. But Leo Ferris did it, and he managed to get all of them on one team no less. Brokering a unique deal with the five college stars, Ferris was able to lure them away from the BAA to join the NBL. He did this by establishing a new NBL team in Indiana, the Indianapolis Olympians, and giving the players ownership stakes. After already struggling financially at the time due to sagging attendance, Leo Ferris' acquisition of all five of Kentucky's main players broke the back of the BAA. BAA President Maurice Podoloff was said to be shocked and surprised as the NBL, for the second year in a row, was able to acquire two of the three best players in college basketball. The BAA failed to get a star of their own to even try to combat the massive move, as Yale's Tony Lavelli, the 1949 Associated Press College Player of the Year, initially rejected both league's offers as he intended to pursue a career in music by enrolling at Juilliard instead of pursuing pro sports. In the wake of the NBL's monumental acquisition of the entire Fabulous Five, press outlets at the time stated that the BAA was, quote, caught with their defenses down. Leo Ferris had devised and executed the perfect play to put an end to the BAA and force them to merge with the NBL, thus creating the NBA. The merger was made official on the 3rd of August, 1949, and here's the first instance of the NBA lying about its own history. 
Even though it was the NBL that forced the BAA to agree to a merger or otherwise face financial ruin, the NBA's own website only recognizes BAA history as its own, failing to even acknowledge the scores, records, championships, or other accomplishments of NBL players or teams. An NBA-produced HBO documentary from 1989 has this gem of a line. In 1946 in New York, this would all change as Maurice Potaloff was selected to preside over a new 11-team league called the Basketball Association of America. Three years later, the BAA absorbed the NBL and the NBA was born. That is precisely the opposite of how it actually happened. On paper, the BAA should have been much stronger than the NBL. The BAA had teams in major markets, New York City, Boston, Detroit, Philadelphia, Toronto. The NBL, on the other hand, operated in smaller towns and cities like Akron, Buffalo, Sheboygan, and Toledo. The BAA had big money owners behind it and had even acquired a handful of NBL teams over the years, notably the Minneapolis Lakers with megastar George Mikan. But the battle for brand supremacy didn't end when the biggest star in the sport switched sides. It only ended once Leo Ferris acquired the Kentucky players for the NBL. But if you look on the NBA's website, they tell you that the deal was the BAA expanding and acquiring teams from the NBL, not a merger between the two leagues. They do this despite the fact that it was the BAA that was forced to merge with the NBL even after getting the Lakers, the Royals, today Sacramento Kings, the Pistons, and the Indianapolis Jets to jump from the NBL to the BAA in prior seasons. So yes, while it is correct to say that the BAA had expanded by acquiring NBL teams, those acquisitions were made prior to the merger and didn't do anything to help the league's stability. To put it in simpler terms, the NBA claims that the BAA expanded even though it was the league that was forced to merge, otherwise it was on the verge of bankruptcy despite all of its market advantages. The truth is that Leo Ferris forced the creation of the NBA. By that measure, he is the most important person in league history. And yet there's one more thing he did that deserves mentioning. Not only did Leo force the NBA into existence, he also saved it from falling out of existence. In the early 1950s, the NBA was struggling hard. Revenue was down across the board, and the league had shriveled to only eight teams. This all came to a head in a now infamous stall game, which saw the Pistons just hold the ball against the Lakers after taking an early lead. The game ended with a score of 19-18 lead Pistons. Yes, basketball games were 48 minutes long even back then, and yes, made baskets were worth two points. So think about how boring it must have been for the paying audience to see a game end with neither team scoring 20 points. But this wasn't because both teams were missing all their shots, they just weren't taking any, because there was no mechanism that would force them to. This game instantly became a stain on the league's reputation, and everyone knew that something needed to change. But nobody knew exactly what to do. Here comes Leo Ferris once again, now serving as the general manager of the Syracuse Nationals. Ferris was the man who calculated the formula for the 24-second shot clock, not Nationals owner Danny Biasone, as is reported by basically everyone nowadays. If Leo is mentioned at all today, rare as it may be, it is as a co-contributor, even though it was he who was directly singled out and given credit for it during the Syracuse Nationals 1954 team banquet by their business manager Bob Sexton. Being the owner of the team, Biasone was also in attendance, and yet Sexton didn't mention him in relation to the shot clock, despite how Biasone is currently given complete credit for the innovation. Famed New York sports journalist Harvey Ayrton wrote, The formula used to create the 24-second clock, the 2,880 seconds of a 48-minute game divided by the average number of shots a game over the previous three seasons, 120, was actually devised by Biasone's general manager, Leo Ferris. But the man with the vision, the member of the rules committee who badgered his contemporaries at almost every meeting between 1951 and 1954, was unquestionably Biasone. Due to his position in the league as a whole as one of its team owners, Biasone was integral in getting the rule adopted. There's no disputing that. But there wouldn't have been a rule for him to fight so hard for had Leo Ferris not devised the formula to begin with. So why has the NBA written Leo Ferris out of its history? In talking with others, I've been given three possible reasons that make sense at face value, two of which completely fall apart with even the most moderate amount of scrutiny. The first failed argument says that, as an owner and GM, Leo was extremely cheap and players and agents resented him for it. 
You could say that about more than half of all owners and GMs in the NBA at any given point in its history. Owners are notoriously cheap, and that would have been even more true in this era of pro sports when it wasn't uncommon to see teams or even entire leagues fold mid-season. The NBA itself saw multiple teams close in its first years post-merger, that's why it was down to only 8 of them. The other argument says that GMs hated working with Leo because Leo was always trying to swindle them to give up more than he was. You know, like any good GM should. The only argument I see that can be used to make sense of Leo's removal from NBA history is that Red Auerbach absolutely hated him, which leads me to believe that Red had a significant hand in erasing Leo from the NBA's history. During an owner's meeting that Leo attended as GM of the Syracuse Nationals and Red as the coach of the Boston Celtics, the two nearly had a physical altercation in the halls of Madison Square Garden, even exchanging threats while being separated. Ferris and Syracuse owner Danny Biasone pushed hard for the league to adopt Ferris's 24-second shot clock. Red, on the other hand, saw it as undermining the integrity of basketball and wanted the motion struck down to preserve the purity of the sport, while Leo wanted to preserve the financial viability of the league by creating a product people would actually pay to see. If Red had gotten his way, there's no reason to believe that the NBA even survives into the 1960s. It was on incredibly thin ice. But while Red Auerbach was a power broker in the NBA up until the early 1990s, Leo Ferris left pro sports behind in the mid-50s, Danny Biasone sold the Nationals in 1963, and Ferris's only other real advocate, close friend Ben Kerner whom Ferris had founded the Hawks with, sold the team in 1968 and completely moved away from the NBA. Only a year prior to Kerner's sale of the Hawks, Red took up front office responsibilities for the Boston Celtics in the 1967 offseason. This turned him from a heavy-handed coach into someone who, contractually, had boatloads of power. In 1992, Red was interviewed by the Syracuse Post Standard as part of an article on Danny Biasone's absence from the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. Here we see the clearest example of his attempt to rewrite history. Red is quoted as saying, Danny Biasone invented the 24-second shot clock by himself. Alone. I was at the meeting when he introduced it. He should get all the credit in the world for it. Really, Red? All by himself? So then why did you threaten Leo who you thought was going to ruin basketball with this new rule? If it was Biasone who introduced it, why were you making these accusations at his GM? With most of the NBA's higher-ups already not thinking too highly of Leo at the time of his departure, it doesn't seem too contrived to think that Red would have used his pull to get the league as a whole to change its historical narrative regarding the shot clock and getting everyone to give the credit to the more amicable Biasone. As for the narrative that says the BAA absorbed the NBL, we're not exactly sure where that started. Maurice Podoloff was the president of the BAA at the time that Ferris forced the merger, and was later made the NBA's first commissioner. This may seem odd initially, the losing side gaining control after the merger, but it makes sense due to Podoloff already being president of the American Hockey League, being a distinguished lawyer, and having worked with the owners of the larger market teams that came from the BAA. He had a lot going for him that could help the NBA grow with him at the helm and the support of major NBL management working beneath him. But the question really becomes, would he be vindictive enough to engage in a rewriting of history even after Leo's innovative thinking saved Podoloff's place in pro basketball not once, but twice? Personally, I'm not inclined to think so, as Podoloff was seen by many as a stabilizing force and an extremely likable man. He didn't need pro basketball, he already had a successful life. Podoloff could have easily just conceded to the NBL, let the BAA fold, and moved on to other ventures. But he didn't. He worked with Ferris and the NBL to get a merger done. He implemented Ferris's shot clock to solve a major problem facing the league. He was a leader that all sides of the aisle revered. The same cannot be said for his successor though, another BAA transplant, J. Walter Kennedy, who served as public relations director for the BAA at the time of the merger. Kennedy took over the NBA at the single roughest point in league history, shrunk into only eight teams, lacking a television contract, the players beginning to unionize, and with the NBA facing competition from the upstart ABL and their innovative three-point line. No, I did not mean to say ABA. The ABL was a league started out of spite after the NBA refused to let the owner of the Harlem Globetrotters buy a pro team, and was the first pro league to have a three-point line. It only lasted for one season, but it's where the ABA would pull inspiration from when considering how to stand out from the NBA and landing on having a three-point line of their own. In opposition to Maurice Podoloff, J. Walter Kennedy was, at his best, described as approachable, and was known to be iron-handed when dealing with issues. 
But in fairness to him, the situations affecting the League during his tenure required that type of personality to keep the ship afloat. With a weaker and less crafty hand, sinking would have been inevitable. Kennedy saw that firsthand when Leo Ferris crippled the BAA with his crafty, forceful move at the Fabulous Five. If anything, Kennedy borrowed more from Ferris than he did from Podoloff in terms of mentality. So unless Red got in Kennedy's ear and really hammered home how much of a grudge he should hold over Leo's steal of the Kentucky players over a decade prior at the time of Kennedy being named the NBA's next commissioner, I can't see Kennedy as the type to willingly rewrite history on his own. Hell, his first major move as NBA commissioner was striking Red with a then-league record fine of $500 due to rowdy behavior during a 1963 preseason game of all things. That's $5,000 in today's money, back before anyone in the NBA was making a significant salary. So where does this leave me? Am I left to blame Red Arbach for both of the lies that buried Leo's legacy? There's enough evidence for me to conclusively believe that Red did change the narrative on the shot clock, but should that carry over to the conspiracy that the BAA absorbed the NBL? No, I don't think so. There's not enough evidence to point me in that direction, and so I feel like I've hit a dead end, which is honestly infuriating. What served as the origin for the biggest lie in NBA history? I don't know, but I'm going to keep looking until I find it. Until then, I will be singing Leo Ferris's praises until the narrative changes. Leo Ferris, in only nine years of working in professional basketball, changed the sport forever. And yet, he's not in the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. He's the only founding member of a current NBA team around at the time of the NBL-BAA merger to not be a Hall of Famer. His creation of the shot clock saved the NBA. Without it, the league would have died before 1960, before Boston became a dynasty, before Wilt's 100-point game, before Kareem introduced the skyhook, and before hoops went mainstream. That then begs the question, without Leo Ferris, what becomes of professional basketball?